All right. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This is the second webinar of Cypher's webinar series, Cryptography Under the Hood. And the topic today will be state of play of post-quantum cryptography, which is a very interesting and topical theme for a webinar indeed. My name is Walteri, and I'm a developer at Xypera. Great to see you all. Many of you may already know Cypher, but for those who don't, I will give a quick introduction. Cypher is a Finnish company founded in 2017. We design hardware-based security solutions using standardized cryptographic algorithms. Cypher's product portfolio consists of secure and efficient cryptographical intellectual property cores or IP cores, which are designed directly for field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs. Feel free to visit us at cypher.com after the webinar for more information. So let's get to the bottom of today's agenda. I would like to I'd like you to remind you that if you have any questions, as I hope you will, please write them to the Q and A uh, inbox that you can find next to the chat icon, and we will go through the questions after the presentation. But for now, may I introduce you to the main star of this event, Dr. Matti Tommiska. Matti is the managing director and co-founder of Cypher. He has his master's as well as doctoral degrees in electrical and electronics engineering. Since his extensive academic career, Matti spent 13 years in both technical and sales roles in leading semiconductor companies prior to co-founding Cypher in 2017. But for now, I will let Matti to talk for himself. Go ahead, Matti. Yeah, thank you, Valtteri, for the introduction. And let me also welcome all participants to this Cypher webinar. And indeed, the topic post-quantum cryptography is very actual and interesting. And I also look forward to your comments and questions. And with that, let's get started. Now, before diving into the actual topic, it is probably a good idea to review both the terminology and definitions just to avoid confusion. First, and this may be self-evident to most of the audience, it is important to understand that the term post-quantum cryptography refers to cryptography whose underlying mathematical problems cannot be broken by quantum computers. Now, importantly, post-quantum cryptography, or PQC, is still computed with traditional electronic computers, for example, uh, processors or silicon chips like FPGS or ASICs, meaning that PQC as such does not require quantum computers to be executed. Now, on the other hand, quantum computing means computing which is based on quantum phenomena, and we'll briefly review some details later in this webinar. Uh, as opposed to po post-quantum cryptography, the term quantum cryptography is a cryptography field on its own. And while this is not the main topic of today's webinar, let me mention that applications like quantum random number generation and quantum key distribution are based on quantum phenomena, and they cannot be performed solely with uh, traditional electronic computers. Now, the definitions at the bottom of the slide include the term public key cryptography, which is also known as asymmetric cryptography. Now, this broadly refers to algorithms such as elliptic curve cryptography and RSA, which are typically used in key exchange and digital signatures. Uh, and importantly for this topic, currently widely used public key cryptographic algorithms will become vulnerable if or when the quantum computers become powerful enough. The term secret key cryptography, uh, also known as symmetric cryptography, uh, typically refers to algorithms such as the well-known AES or advanced encryption standard, 
And these algorithms are typically used to encrypt and decrypt the so-called bulk traffic after, for example, public key cryptographic algorithms have been used to exchange the secret key or secret keys. And finally, the term effective key length, this doesn't necessarily mean the actual physical length in bits of the key used in a cryptographic algorithms. Uh, instead, it refers to a corresponding time which would be required to break the algorithm in a so-called brute force search in a search space, which is a power of two of the effective key length. Now, quantum computers, that's obviously a very interesting topic. And during the past couple of years, both established big companies as well as promising startups have been active in this field. And a lot of interesting developments are taking place uh, simultaneously. Now, at the fundamental level, quantum computers exploit quantum phenomena. And these phenomena sometimes even defy common sense. Now, while this webinar is not about quantum mechanics as such, and I first and foremost want to claim that I'm not an expert with deep knowledge on this, top on this topic, let me just mention superposition and entanglement as examples of quantum phenomena. Superposition means that the value of an individual qubit or quantum bit actually has a certain probability distribution between zero and one. And the value of a qubit is resolved to either zero or one only at measurement time. Uh, the other quantum mechanical phenomenon named as entanglement means that even if two particles are physically distanced, even by vast distances, they do remain connected or entangled. And when either one of them resolves to either zero or one, the same happens instantly also to the physically distanced qubit. Now the internal workings of quantum computers are beyond the scope of this webinar presentation. Uh, but let me mention as an example that IBM announced that they have built a quantum computer with 127 qubits a couple of months ago, in November, 2021. Now, how many of these qubits would be usable in breaking cryptographic algorithms is unknown. And also the term cryptographically relevant quantum computer has lately been taken into use. Uh, probably the most well-known algorithm utilizing the quantum computing power was introduced by Peter Shor in 1994, almost three decades ago. And interestingly, even before even rudimentary working quantum computers existed. Uh, now, the main result of Shor's algorithm is that certain mathematical problems, importantly for public key cryptography, the underlying problems of RSA and elliptic curve cryptography namely integer factoring and discrete logarithm problem can be solved in polynomial time. And what this means in practice that so-called brute force search is no longer needed to break neither RSA nor ECC. And since importantly, practically all uh, present day internet security relies on RSA and or ECC, it can be claimed that Shor's algorithm when executed on a powerful enough quantum computer, will present a concrete forthcoming threat to current internet security. For example, the long-term validity of root keys and digital certificates may be compromised. Now, however, let us also note that based on current public information, the largest integer factor so far by Shor's algorithm on a real quantum computer is just 21, which indeed was correctly factored into three times seven by a quantum computer. And on the surface, it may seem that we are still a long, long way off from a real threat to breaking RSA, as an example, since current RSA keys are thousands of bits long. Now, I will also mention another algorithm, interestingly also from the 90s, the so-called Grover's algorithm. And in a nutshell, Grover's algorithm, when executed on a quantum computer, reduces the size of a brute force search space to a square root of the original search space. And in practice, this means that symmetric algorithms of today need to double the key length to maintain the same security level. As an example, advanced encryption standard or AES during the quantum computing era will require 256 bit, six bit keys 
to achieve current pre-quantum computing near a security level of 128 bits. Now, an understandable question is, of course, that should we, meaning the practitioners and users of cryptography, worry about the quantum computing threat already today. Uh, like I mentioned, as an example, RSA keys are thousands of bits long, and 21 is still the largest integer factor by Shor's algorithm on a quantum compute, based on public information. Now, I think that despite this, we should care about quantum computing and take post-quantum cryptography very seriously already today. And first, let us remember that while we should not believe in conspiracy theories, there can be advances, advances in quantum computing which are not known in the public domain. And second, the cryptographic community, meaning in the broad sense of the word, both the academia and the security industry, has understandably the mindset that we must always assume the worst case scenario in our threat models. And a concrete potential threat can be a powerful nation state with immense resources, both time and money, as an adversary. And since certain encrypted messages and information will have enormous value for many decades to come, we can think of, for example, diplomatic messages and or strategic military plans. And this threat model is known as record today, break tomorrow. And we must also consider the lifetime of products and systems which are planned and designed today. Should we make them at least upgradable to eventually withstand quantum computing attacks? Now, based on the potential quantum computing threat to current public key cryptography, NIST, or the National Institute of Standards and Technology of the United States, decided to start a post-quantum cryptography standardization process in 2016. This so-called PQC competition has progressed through rounds one and two, and it's currently approaching the end of round three. During the first two rounds, the number of remaining algorithms in the competition decreased from the originally accepted 69 algorithms to the current level of seven finalists and eight alternatives. And I'll also mention that all information about the algorithms, including their cryptanalysis, is available in the public domain. Uh, you are, of course, welcome to visit, for example, the NIST PQC website for more details in case you are interested. Now, the original goal by NIST was to select the winning algorithms by end of 2021, but recently they have updated the timetable for round three winners to be announced by the end of this month, this March. Uh, so we are very likely, unless there is further delay, very close to exciting news from NIST. Now, however, the eventual forthcoming announcement of winning algorithms from round three, while it's a very important milestone on its own, is not the end of the PQC competition process. Because during the coming years, the winning algorithms will be defined into standards. And NIST will also likely start an additional round, round four, for standardizing additional algorithms, possibly even new submissions. And obviously, you should also note that the dates beyond 2022 on this slide are estimates, and they obviously may change. Now, as mentioned, there are currently seven remaining finalists in NIST PQC competition and round three. The seven finalists are presented on this slide, and they have been categorized in both the eventual application level be it either key encapsulation mechanism or chem or signature scheme, and also color coded based on the underlying mathematical problem. Obviously, the underlying mathematics of these finalists are beyond the time and scope of this webinar, but once again, if you are interested, all information is in the public domain. As can be seen, there are four finalists for chem, namely classic McAleese which is also the only remaining code-based algorithm, and three additional algorithms, Crystal Skyber, NTRU, and Saber, which are all based on structural lattices. Now, the three finalists for signature schemes are Crystal's, Dilithium, Falcon, and Rainbow. 
and of the finalists for signature schemes, uh, Rainbow, which incidentally is also the only remaining so-called multivariate algorithm, uh, serious vulnerabilities have been found recently in the Rainbow algorithm, and generally speaking, it's regarded as highly susceptible. Uh, this slide is intended to show a quite a high-level block diagram of an, one lattice-based algorithm, namely Christoph Skyber. And this is indeed a finalist for key encapsulation mechanism, or KEM. Uh, as can be seen, there are a number of individual blocks uh, colored in blue. And as can be li likely be imagined, there will be a lot of demand in mathematics and or cryptographic algorithms in each individual blue colored block. Now, continuing just a little bit with Crystal Skyber theme from the previous slide, the purpose is, of course, by no means to do a deep dive into the actual internals of the algorithm and its eventual implementation, but rather to give you, uh, the audience, a preview of what is included in a finalist lattice based algorithm and using Crystal Skybers, just as an example. Uh, as a high level takeaway, let's observe that the four main operations or submodules or subprograms, if you like, uh, required in Crystal Skyper are number theoretic transform or NTT, uh, polynomial arithmetic algorithms, samplings from centered binomial distributions or CBD, and pseudo random functions or PRF, and extensible output functions or XOF based on SHA3 or SHEG hash algorithm. And also, while not mentioned explicitly on this slide, also a true random number generator is required. Uh, the other finalists are not covered in any level of detail in this webinar. Uh, I just used Krista Skyber as an hopefully representative high level example of the demanding complexity of designing uh, a PQC algorithm implementation from scratch. Uh, let us also review some of the main differences between forthcoming PQC algorithms with current public key algorithms. This slide presents some example comparisons, and it's not a complete or comprehensive list. Uh, the table on the right hand side of the slide uses elliptic curve cryptographic or ECC as a representative or widely used current public key algorithm or algorithm family to be more exact. Uh, ECC indeed has mostly replaced RSA as the current public key algorithm of choice due mainly to its shorter key length. For security level one, which is the lowest acceptable security level, an ECC key length of 32 bytes or 256 bits is considered sufficient. This applies for both the private and public key. For security level five, the highest defined security level in other words, ECC algorithms are required to use 64 bytes or 512 bits as the key length, both public and private. Now let's compare the ECC key length to PQC algorithms, and we'll definitely notice that likely the biggest difference is the increased key length with PQC algorithms. The most extreme example is classic McAleese, which will require literally millions of bits for its public key. And as we remember from the previous slides, classic McAleese is the only remaining finalist from the so-called code-based algorithms, and these are generally fast to execute. Now, however, the long key length requirements in classic McAleese may be considered a disadvantage in, in certain systems, for example, in memory constraint embedded systems. Uh, as a generalization, when it comes to latency, which is the time required to actually run the algorithm. There are differences between current ECC and potential PQC algorithms. As an example of an alternative scheme, let us look at SIKE, which does have the advantage of reasonably small key length about the size of current RSA keys, but the algorithm itself is considered very slow. So as a conclusion from this slide, while we do not yet know the winning algorithms from NIST round three, it's already now obvious that there are both pros and cons with the algorithms, key lengths, performance, 
which must be carefully considered when we take these algorithms into use and design them into actual systems. Now, NIST hasn't been the only uh, information or standardization body which has been active with post-quantum cryptography. Certain major European information security and government agencies have also published recommendations on post-quantum cryptography. As an example, the German BSI recommends that if you want to design PQC support today, they recommend algorithms are, uh, or they recommend algorithms are classic McAleese or fraud or Frodochem. Frodochem is a NIST alternative scheme based on lattices. Now, as another example from a European government agency, I'll take the French AEN SSI. They recommend that for long lifetime products uh, designed today, they mentioned in the year 2030, the so-called post-quantum defense in death theme, scheme should be taken into consideration. And AEN SSI recommends, but doesn't mandate, the use of either Frodochem, uh, Crystal Skyber, Dilithium, or Falcon as the PQC algorithm. Now, there are also activities, standardization activities with two major internet security protocols, namely Transport Layer Security or TLS and IPSEC, or which uh, IKE or Internet Key Exchange is a fundamental part. And at some point, these uh, uh, security protocols will very likely adapt to support post-quantum algorithms as well. Standardization activities are ongoing. Uh, I will also mention the term hybridation, which in this particular context means the coexistence of PQC and classical public key algorithms. Now, the rationale for hybridation in a nutshell is that even if one of the two algorithms is broken, the output from a KDF or key derivation function can still be considered secure as long as the other inputting algorithm remains secure and unbroken. Uh, let's conclude with a couple of takeaways on post-quantum cryptography. And probably the main recommendation in our opinion is that for systems and products which are being designed today, and especially those with a relatively long lifetime, it's that while it may not be necessary to design in a PQC algorithm or algorithms immediately, there should at least be, at a minimum, there should be a secure mechanism to update the product or system to support PQC at some point in the future. Uh, there will obviously be a transition uh, period, possibly lasting several years, when we will see the coexistence or hybridization of classical and PQC public key algorithms. Now, since hardware-based security, uh, meaning cryptographic algorithms implemented directly in digital logic and not in software, this was also the topic of our previous webinar, uh, hardware-based security is typically used for highest security levels and or highest performance. We do know that field programmable gate arrays or FPGAs, since they indeed are reprogrammable, as the name implies, they will definitely have distinct advantages when compared to so-called fixed function silicon like application specific integrated circuits or ASICs or trusted platform modules or TPMs. Uh, it will take some time, likely a couple of years before uh, the winning PQC algorithms from NIST round three and also eventually round four are ironed out into concrete standards. And I'll also mention that quantum cryptography will have niche applications such as point-to-point -point connections on dedicated links, but it will not be a scalable solution for multi-point connections. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we are about to enter an exciting transition time into eventual post-quantum cryptography, and importantly, so-called traditional computing based, for example, on digital logic, such as FPGS, will play an important role in that transition. Now, I want to thank you very much, and now I hand over to Valtteri for handling the Q&A session. Thank you, Matti, for the interesting presentation. It was exciting to hear, especially about the differences of possible PQC algorithms and the uh, comparison that the ECC used today. 
including the key length comparison. And now it's time to take the questions. I see there's quite many in the Q&A box already. All right, the first question is about the hybridization that you mentioned last or in the latter part of your presentation. So isn't it very expensive in terms of communication bandwidth and computation time to use the hybrid theme? And uh, you have to send the data twice and do all the co computation twice, is that correct? Uh, now the details uh, do not uh, have not been shown on the slide, but I would say that the uh, latency does not increase significantly because you can run these uh, hybrid uh, or the hybridization scheme algorithms in parallel. And as for the input data, it's typically of relatively small size and doesn't use much bandwidth. So I would say that the price to the so-called price to pay for hybridization is. Uh, not significant in terms of execution time and or resources. All right, thank you. Uh, there is another one close to this matter. So how about the PQ, PQC algorithms uh, as a loan? So how about the computation resources and time of the PQC algorithms alone? So that's still a TBD depending on the algorithm and uh, the initial estimates that we have done on certain algorithms indicate that uh, they can even be faster in certain cases than when compared to current, uh, public, current ECC algorithms. All right, thank you. That, that answers the question at, at this time. And then there's more practical question uh, concerning the quantum com computers itself. So do you have any opinion or where do you see so, uh, when are actual quantum computers going to be available on a commercial market or what are the big players that are going to acquire them the first? Yeah, that's frankly speaking a topic which is outside of my core competency uh, and I rely on public information and uh, some people mention five years, some people mention 10 years, some people mention 15 years as a time span from today to the eventual practical applications of quantum computing. Uh, people also talk about quantum computing as a service. Uh, so they, uh, because quantum computers are obviously very expensive to build and acquire so their computation power may be offered over the internet to, to, to those who want to use them. And obviously, like I mentioned in one, on one of the slides, we also have to remember that quantum computing is a quickly evolving field and potentially not all advances are announced in the public domain. And uh, as for the company landscape, when it comes to quantum computing, um, I personally, am not, I'm not a super expert on that. I don't have any personal favorites or, 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 fa or favorite companies in that race. I just wish that uh, uh, science advances at a certain pace. And ultimately, I do believe that quantum computing will play a huge role in uh, the advancement of human life for example, in genome sequencing and many other, other potential applications. As for our business at Cyphera, the, we focus on post-quantum cryptography and the, the eventual application of post-quantum cryptographic algorithms to counter the threat of quantum computers. Thank you. Thank you, Matti. Well, you laid the ground perfectly for our next question because we, I think we are now approaching your core competencies with this one. So are P PQC's algorithms expected to consume a lot of FPGA space or utilization? And uh, could you compare, for example, for AES core? Uh, 
the utilization of an PQC or what do you think? Yeah, so obviously at some point we will also launch IP core supporting PQC and uh, I don't want to turn this into an advertisement for Zyphera products, but we typically have products in three different categories, C, B and H. C being compact, B being balanced and H being high speed. And especially the C class uh, IP cores are optimized for low FPGA resource utilization. And our current ECC and RSA portfolio consists exclusively of C or compact IP cores. We will have also other offerings available in the next uh, couple of quarters. Uh, I don't think that the PQC algorithms based on the uh, initial work that we have done will require dramatically more FPGA resources than current public key algorithms. The only difference is in the key length, which depending on the algorithm can be handled with the, with the FPGA internal memory box or some other mechanism. As for AES cores, especially when you compare to the AES cores, which have high performance gigabits or tens of gigabits of throughput, they will definitely, the AES cores, high speed AES cores will definitely be larger than the forthcoming PQC IP cores that I can say with quite high level of certainty. Thank you, Matti, for the excellent answer. And then, then the PQC algorithms are the finalists. Uh, do you have any favorite algorithms or do you see any likeliest winners of these uh, finalists and alternatives? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, as you may remember, there are seven finalists and five of them belong to the so-called lattice-based family of algorithms. And additionally, Rainbow, the only multivariate algorithm, is considered susceptible at this point by the cryptographic community. So it's quite easy mathematics to conclude that with high likelihood, a lattice-based algorithm will be at least one of the winners. And the other non-lattice-based algorithm, in addition to Rainbow, is the classic McKellie's algorithm, the code-based um, algorithm. It has certain advantages like high performance, but like I mentioned on one of the slides, its key length requirements, literally millions of bits for the public keys, can be a handicap in certain, especially memory or power constraint embedded applications. So I don't, strictly speaking, I don't have a favorite amongst the algorithms. I don't even necessarily know the internal workings of all of them, but by simple mathematics and the, and the laws of probability, it would be a relatively safe bet, if you like, to, to say that lattice-based algorithms are very strong candidates to be amongst the winners in at least round three. Thank you, Matti. That answers the question perfect, perfectly. And uh, uh, you mentioned the rainbow algorithm already and a little bit bad publicity. And uh, it was recently broken, although it's one of the uh, NIST finalists. Uh, what do you think about the security of the other finalists? Could we possibly find problems there? Yeah, that's a very important question and it's uh, impossible for me at this stage uh, to answer that uh, completely, but I'll just make a couple of observations. So first of all, the NIST competition has been going on for five, six years now and the interest and the public crypto analysis of the candidates has been quite extensive. And from that point of view, we can be relatively confident that the winning algorithms are safe or secure. On the other hand, the history of cryptography has proven that um, algorithms which one day were considered secure have been broken by some advanced crypto analysis uh, in the future. So that's why we should also consider the possibility that the eventual winners of round three and potentially round four of this competition may be found vulnerable or susceptible to attacks 
in the next couple of years. So that's why it's a good idea to have updatability capabilities in your system, whether you base them on, on, on software or hardware. And it will take a relatively long time, in my opinion, and I'm not the only one sharing this opinion, it will take a relatively long time before the PQC field will stabilize itself to a same, I would say, relatively stable state where traditional public key cryptography has been for the next 10, 10, 10 or so years. Thank you, Matti. All right. Thank you all. Uh, it's time to wrap things up. And unfortunately, we couldn't address all of your great questions. And if your question was left without an answer uh, this time, don't hesitate to send it to directly to Matti or Cyphera. Uh, you can see the email addresses in the bottom of the slide. As we heard, exciting times ahead as the PQC algorithms are in the final stretch. And it is my pleasure to announce also the Cypheras next webinar. The next webinar will most likely focus on the winning algorithms that is going to be re released. Uh, the webinar is going to be held on the 8th of June. The registration is already open and you can find the link shown on this slide. See you there and thank you all for today. Bye-bye.